Welcome everyone to the second collaborative webinar of the AAMC and APSA 2023 to 2024 Applicant Interactive Series. APSA is very pleased to co-host this session with the AAMC group on research, education, and training, better known as GREAT. This session tonight features six program directors across six specialties. My name is Rohini Gwynn and I'm your moderator for the evening. I'm a second year MD PhD student at Stony Brook and also the national chair for fundraising on APSA's um, national board. We also have Carrie Jansen here, who is an MD PhD student in her final year at Emory and also the treasurer for APSA, and Via Tang, who is an M3 at UNC Chapel Hill's MD PhD program, who is the president elect for APSA. And they will both be helping as well to moderate tonight. For those who are not aware, the American Physician Scientists Association, or APSA, was founded in 2003 by dual degree trainees to better serve and represent the needs of dual degree scientists. Today, our organization has grown to reach students across nearly 100 MD or DO PhD programs and consists of over 1,800 members. Tonight's session will include formal presentations by our panelists, followed by a group Q&A. The second half will feature breakout room sessions where participants can join the breakout rooms of the interested specialty or program director that they wish to speak further with. We will not be recording the breakout rooms to help facilitate more candid conversations, but please feel, to, feel free to switch between breakout rooms. This collaborative series was created to help engage our member base, namely physician scientist trainees, with directors and practicing physician scientists who are part of the AAMC GREAT group, which convenes administrative leaders of PhD, MD, PhD, and postdoctoral programs. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Marshall Horowitz, the current University of Washington MSTP director and one of the co-chairs of the AAMC GREAT TOPS committee with Dr. Christopher Williams. Great. Uh... Pardon the pun. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'd um, especially like to thank uh, those who helped organize this session, including uh, Rohini and the leadership of APSA, um, as well as um, the participants um, of the great group at AAMC and the TOPS um, subcommittee. I'm speaking be on behalf of um, Christopher Williams, who is the MD-PhD director at Vanderbilt and uh, who could not be here this evening, but Chris has done most of the heavy lifting. Um, yeah, you can put it to the first slide, please, Ro Rohini. Um, and also many thanks um, to um, Sumara uh, Hussein at the AAMC helping to organize everybody. And you may recognize a few of the faces on this slide because um, we have uh, uh, David Harpole from Duke, Nicholas Moore from Iowa, and uh, Charles Emila from uh, Columbia, who will all be um, presenting their respective specialties tonight. Um, this slide is from a survey of the MD-PhD workforce that reflects a uh, very large outcome study that was conducted uh, by Miles Sakabas at Albert Einstein and Skip Brass at Penn, who are uh, two well-known MD-PhD, MSTP program directors. And it shows the distribution of MD-PhDs um, in the workforce. Uh, internal medicine has historically been the most popular discipline followed by pathology and pediatrics. But I suspect if you um, categorize these numbers or stratified them, by a more recent entry, you would find um, increasing interest in surgical uh, surgery and surgical subspecialties. At least uh, that, that's the impression and, and that's the uh, outcomes at our program where there's growing interest. And I think it's, uh, uh, and, and um, emergency medicine uh, and some of the other specialties like dermatology that are represented here tonight. So I think that this is a particularly appropriate group to um, have uh, talk about uh, their respective medical specialties uh, tonight. Next slide, please. Um, there's a lot of variation among 
um, PSTPs and research residencies. Part of it reflects discipline, specific organization, but even within a subspecialty or specialty, you will find that programs uh, vary quite a bit. It's not as standardized as you might otherwise see in uh, pre-doctoral MD, PhD programs, which even then vary quite a bit. Next slide, please. Um, and some disciplines have formal physician scientist uh, allowances uh, and some do not. And shown here are radiology, dermatology, pathology, ABIM, and pediatrics. It's a, it's a really complicated uh, landscape to navigate uh, because there are two pathways, categorical and a research pathway in internal medicine. And then in pediatrics, there are actually several different pathways that are conducive to physician scientist training. Uh, and the same goes for the other disciplines um, shown here. Next slide. Um, you, you know, all types of different models um, not one is better than the other. Um, some uh, institutions have a more centralized structure where the various uh, PSTPs and research residencies uh, interact or are brought under a single umbrella program, uh, while others operate in parallel uh, or have different structures depending on uh, which particular residency is offered. Uh, next slide, please. And there have been a couple of um, very useful uh, publications on physician scientist uh, training pathways uh, led by my colleague, um, Chris Williams. And so I would encourage you to take a look at this uh, eLife publication uh, because it um, helps describe the landscape and also offers some practical tips and advice for um, those of you who um, will be applying uh, to these programs. Next slide, please. Um, there are lots of different questions and um, data points uh, that are worthwhile developing. It's a, it's a long career road. Uh, there's pipeline, it leaks all over the place. And uh, our goal as um, directors of uh, pre-doctoral MD, PhD programs and postdoctoral um, research residencies and PSTPs is to plug the holes in that pipeline and to facilitate uh, the transition uh, from graduating medical school to becoming uh, a physician scientist employed in an academic setting or in uh, pharma uh, or industry or governmental lab, uh, but uh, devoting yourself to a career as a physician scientist. And there are lots of challenges and there are lots of distractions along the way. And um, we think it's an important goal uh, to get more physician scientists into the workforce. And that is motivating uh, the efforts that you see before you tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So for the applicants, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll have many questions to consider and ho hopefully after having a chance to participate in this forum, you'll have um, even more questions that you want, want to address. H historically, one of the distinguishing features has been that a program may offer a letter of intent for specific clinical fellowships. Um, that has uh, changed somewhat for a variety of reasons and you, you may or may not hear about some of those reasons. Um, you know, programs differ in how much protected research time is available, uh, which mentors and research programs are available within the institution for a particular program. Uh, it's important to look at the track record and what recent grads are doing now. Of course, programs have to get off the ground and have to get started at some point. Um, so uh, you shouldn't necessarily exclude brand new programs. In, in fact, some of those may um, have the most motivated uh, people involved. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, you know, one of the biggest reasons why people leave a physician scientist pathway is uh, due to uh, the fact that you can make more money 
uh, uh, not doing so. And so an important consideration are the salary, uh, research financial support that's offered, whether there are moonlighting opportunities um, or, or whether uh, the program supports you well enough so that you don't even need to consider moonlighting opportunities. And then, um, you know, think about what makes it a program. How cohesive is it? How much interaction are you going to have with uh, potential faculty mentors and your colleagues um, and the sorts of support that you're going to find uh, it, at the institution as a whole, um, the residency uh, in aggregate, and uh, the particular pathway that you're in. Um, next slide. I think that's... Um, so, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll uh, hand it back over to you, Rohini, uh, to introduce um, our speakers. Sure, thank you so much for that overview. So we'll now uh, transition to the presentation portion. So each of our panelists will give a brief overview of their specialty and research program. So in the interest of time, I will mention their names and specialties now, but they will all be able to give more full introductions when beginning their presentations. So today we are joined by six panelists. So they are Dr. Nicholas Moore, who is um, in emergency medicine, Dr. Charles Emola, who's in anesthesi anesthesiology, Dr. Amy Payne, who's in dermatology, Dr. David Harpel, who's in surgery, Dr. Nadar Portian, who's in neurosurgery, and Dr. Jonathan Schinnaker, who's in orthopedics. So I will return to sharing my screen and um, let Dr. Moore take us uh, through his set of presentation material. Great, thanks Rohini. <clears throat> Just to make sure, can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. We're really happy that you're here. I'm Nick Moore from the University of Iowa um, and I'm uh, gonna talk tonight about emergency medicine. I'm a program director of a physician scientist training program here at the University of Iowa. We can go on to the next slide. So we'll talk uh, tonight, and I know that we're uh, going to keep our presentations short, so happy to answer questions um, at the end or in the breakouts. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the scope of emergency care research. We'll talk about uh, uh, postgraduate training, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, what emergency care research pathways look like. Next slide. So many of you know what emergency medicine as a specialty is. This is a specialty that focuses on the care of patients with time-sensitive acute illness. And that spans a lot of different uh, disease processes, organ systems. Many people who've trained in emergency medicine work in emergency departments, but increasingly there are sub subspecialty practice opportunities as well. You can go on to the next slide. This gives uh, a, an indication of some of the subspecialties in emergency medicine. The most uh, prevalent of those in people who are going into fellowship and who have been board certified are uh, critical care. And there are three pathways in critical care medicine, medical toxicology, emergency, medicine, emergency medical services, and pediatric emergency medicine. There are a number of other specialties here. The specialties on this uh, uh, chart that have an asterisk are those that have uh, ACGME board certification, but I'd say that most of the people who are pursuing uh, careers as physician scientists um, have gone through some kind of specialty training in an area where they're planning to develop a research career as well. You can go on to the next slide. Emergency medicine research is broad. Many of you have heard of the translational medicine model here. Um, there are investigators in departments of emergency medicine that are doing basic science research, basic receptor biology. Um, there are uh, people who are doing clinical trials, early stage clinical trials. There's an NIH funded clinical trials network called the SIREN network um, in emergency medicine right now. There are people who are doing health services research, uh, who are doing public health research because of the exposure uh, that patients who, or that investigators doing research in emergency departments have. This is a relatively large practice environment. There are 140 million visits to U.S. emergency departments every year. And so there are a number of investigators who are doing funded work, research in implementation science, public health, and healthcare delivery. We can go on to the next slide. One sort of unique aspect to emergency medicine research is who's funding it. 
in many disciplines, um, you know, a single NIH institute would fund much of the research in a discipline, and that's not true in emergency medicine. The plurality would be funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and that's focused on maybe research in cardiac arrest or lung injury or uh, uh, resuscitation. But the National Institutes of Aging, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, National Institute of Neurologic Diseases and Stroke, and the National Institute of Drug Abuse um, collectively fund almost two-thirds of the NIH-funded research in emergency medicine, which again is, is relatively unique. Um, what I guess I would say about projects that are being done in departments of emergency medicine is that they tend to be highly collaborative with large research teams that are in many cases uh, led by people in departments of emergency medicine, but um, that are really looking more broadly at a particular disease process um, and especially the very early aspects of care of patients who have those conditions. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, there are a number of different pathways uh, by which people pursue training, uh, research training in emergency medicine. The kind of more traditional pathway has been people who uh, do a research fellowship after a clinical residency program. Um, and for people who have not done a PhD in the past, sometimes there's some additional training associated with that. People who have graduated from an MSTP program typically um, are, are uh, have time allocated for dedicated mentored research um, during which they may be writing their K application. Increasingly, though, as more graduates from emergency medicine are doing clinical fellowships, that's being integrated. And we have a number of programs now in departments of emergency medicine that uh, are more formally PSTP programs. And that's the kind of pathway over here on the far right. In a PSTP program, uh, clinical residency and uh, the clinical fellowship both are integrated with a mentored uh, clinical research program and uh, time is allocated to be able to do that work. One of the things that uh, is particularly conducive uh, to having research time in emergency medicine is that because clinical work is scheduled as shift work, it can be integrated more, um, more, more clearly, I guess, with people who are doing work in a lab or people who are doing health services research or people who are doing work in clinical trials. We have a publication that's been accepted and will be coming out soon that's, that highlights residency programs that have uh, this style of integrated training between residency, clinical fellowship, and research all through a longitudinal curriculum. And we have the institutions that will be published in that, uh, in that paper coming out in the, uh, in the graphic on the right. We can go on to the next slide. So I will stop there. My email address is on this slide. Um, if you have additional questions, certainly happy to talk in the breakout room. Um, I want to make sure that we get through all the presentations efficiently tonight. So I'll, I will uh, stop there and look forward to talking with many of you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Our next panelist will be Dr. Charles Emela for um, speaking on behalf of anesthesiology. Is it okay if I share my screen so I can advance the slides? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining. I'm Charles Emela. I'm the Vice Chair for Research uh, at Columbia University in New York, and I also oversee uh, a PSTP <clears throat> training program within our department. Um, much like uh, some of the comments from Dr. Moore in emergency medicine, anesthesiology research is also quite broad um, for similar reasons. We uh, take care of patients across all age uh, and many disease uh, organ systems, um, in intensive care units, in pain clinics, in operating rooms, and so forth. So our research portfolio is really quite wide, um, from basic science to health services research uh, and everything in between. Um, often people think of anesthesiology research as limited to the brain uh, or how anesthetics work. Uh, and although there's a small component of that in anesthesiology research, um, the perioperative setting of operating rooms, labor and delivery, intensive care units, and pain clinics really encompass physiological homeostasis of many organ systems that lend themselves to appropriate research topics in anesthesiology. Likewise, we care for patients with a diverse array of disease pathologies presenting for perioperative care, and as I mentioned, across all age groups. So from basic science of cryo-EM structure, protein interactions, to epidemiolo epidemiological 
clinical outcomes of vast patient populations all fall within the, the purview of anesthesiology research. Um, so anesthesiology research touches on a diverse array of basic and clinical research domains. Because anesthesiologists provide clinical care across entire spectra of physiologic organ function, disease pathologies, age groups, and population health arenas. Um, this is a non-scientific uh, uh, word map um, that I, I constructed just for my uh, uh, impressions of where uh, some of the broadest uh, impact and volume of research in anesthesiology. Um, a lot of work in pain, um, in both the, the clinical treatment of pain, as well as the basic uh, mechanisms of pain. A lot of work around mechanical ventilation, organ protection from ischemia reperfusion injury, um, ICU, uh, abinergic, uh, other G protein couple signaling pathways, um, really a, a broad breadth um, leading to uh, outcome studies uh, in the perioperative space. So the, the research pathway uh, or the clinical and followed by the research pathway in anesthesiology, it's a four year um, residency beginning with a, typically a transitional in, internship and three years of clinical anesthesiology training with up to six months of research that can be embedded in the four year program. Um, that six months is um, uh, allowed by the American Board of Anesthesiology for credentialing. A large percentage of residents go on to do a one-year clinical fellowship, um, and there are six subspecialty accredited clinical fellowships in anesthesiology, including critical care or ICU, pain, uh, cardiothoracic anesthesiology, pediatric anesthesiology, regional anesthesiology, and obstetrics. In addition to that, uh, many programs offer uh, additional non-accredited clinical or research fellowships, including neuroanesthesia, transplant anesthesia, and critical care anesthesia outside of the ACGME accredited pathway, as well as straight research uh, fellowship years. These types of non-accredited fellowships uh, lend themselves to up to 80% of research effort time being devoted to research, which also allows these individuals to qualify for T32 training grants, which I'll speak about in just a minute. These uh, clinical fellowships for those in a research track um, are typically followed by time on a T32. There's currently 20 T32s nationally in anesthesiology. These tend to be two to three year times uh, on the T32. And we're very fortunate in the specialty of anesthesiology to have a number of foundations that I'll mention that continue to support physician scientist development with money and time equivalent to a K award for a two year period. Um, we're very fortunate for that to, to bolster. And during that period of time, typically um, individuals during the T32 and or this uh, foundation period of time are being uh, mentored to uh, pursue NIHK awards. There are, as I mentioned, um, uh, 20 uh, T32s, and this is a, uh, a list of some of the anesthesiology departments around the country that have formal PSTP uh, tracks, 20 of which also have T32 programs. Um, as uh, Marshall mentioned in the opening, uh, new, no two programs are exactly alike. Um, every program has its own uh, strengths, weaknesses, uh, mentorship teams, uh, integration with other specialties and so forth. Uh, so unfortunately there's no uh, cookie cutter approach but really requires um, some individual investigations of respective programs. Uh, to learn uh, a lot. There's also uh, uh, a website I just wanted to point out called the Early Stage Anesthesia Scholars, uh, a bunch of uh, very motivated young uh, physician scientists in the specialty who tend to uh, offer all sorts of resources and advice to uh, medical students, MSDP students who are considering uh, research careers. So the Early Stage Anesthesia Scholars is a very informative website. So I mentioned uh, some of the foundations that provide um, research funding for uh, uh, physician scientists and the best in our specialty is an organization called the Foundation for Anesthesia Education and Research that offers a two year mentor research training grant that is uh, formulated exactly like a K08 and it's done on purpose uh, to help the mentee prepare for uh, a K08 or a K23 application. Uh, the FAIR Foundation sponsors with a number of other 
anesthesia related uh, foundations such as the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, the Society of Obstetric Anesthesia Perinatology, and even the National Institutes of Aging for um, co-sponsored grants. Um, these mentored research training grants are really the most appropriate in the physician scientist track, although the FAIR Foundation has other uh, uh, supports for later career development. Additionally, uh, the International Anesthesia Research Society uh, has a similar mechanism of two year of K type level support. Um, this is um, another leading uh, support of physician scientist development. And then a number of subspecialties within, our, uh, within anesthesiology also have their own grant mechanisms. So we're very robust in foundation level support uh, for helping uh, physician scientists transition into the NIH pathway. Um, and I just wanted to finish with sort of um, some, some uptrending and encouraging news within um, the specialty of anesthesiology as far as uh, the NIH funding to anesthesiology departments has uh, more than doubled um, over the last 15 years and has had a, about a 70% uptick since 2015. And in parallel with that is the number of K awards um, and T32 programs, but notably the K awards that are going to anesthesiology physician scientists have market increased um, in the last uh, eight, seven, eight years or so. Um, so I'll, uh, this is my email. I'll be happy to uh, meet anybody offline that would like to learn more about it. And I look forward to seeing everyone uh, in the breakout room. So let me see if I can stop sharing. Here we go. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Amala. Our next panelist is Dr. Amy Payne, who will be speaking to dermatology. Wonderful. This has been fun. I'm, I have enjoyed learning about um, emergency medicine and anesthesiology, which I've uh, learned about, but um, haven't. that was a great presentation. I feel like I uh, learned a lot, a lot of good data in there. So I think that we're supposed to give you a brief overview of why you should consider um, physician scientists training in these particular specialties. And so in a nutshell for Durham, you will make good friends, present exciting science around the world and win lots of money. So I wanted to do a brief introduction um, to myself. So I was born in Corvallis. I spent all of my school years in Columbus. I went uh, to Stanford for undergrad where I studied uh, DNA repair and xeroderma pigmentosum with Gilbert Chu, uh, met my future hubby there. Um, then moved to um, MDPG at Washington University, where I uh, worked with Jonathan Gitlin on copper transport in Menkes and Wilson's disease. And part of the reason why I share this is, even though I guess you could argue in retrospect, all of these things were um, relevant to dermatology at no point um, during this phase was I considering uh, doing dermatology until much later um, in my MD, PhD career. And I feel like in dermatology, we're very open to that. We actually like it when people come in with experience in other fields so that you can bring it into the specialty. Um, you know, during that time um, of my MD, PhD, um, Marie came along, then Jackson, and ultimately everybody's favorite family member, Winston. So the dermatology um, residency and postdoctoral fellowship I then came to University of Pennsylvania for, and there I worked with John Stanley on uh, B cell repertoire profiling in Pemphigus. Um, and most recently, I then moved to Columbia just a month ago um, to become the chair of dermatology. And so actually, this has been a very interesting um, move for me because we just finished our uh, residency interviews. And one of my favorite uh, chairs in dermatology always told me that when you've seen one institution, you've seen one institution. And so basically everybody does it a little bit differently. And so it's given me a little bit of a broader perspective on physician scientist training um, in Durham. And so just for a little bit of background, my clinical and area of expertise is Pemphigus. Um, here's my lab send off um, right before I left from Philly uh, to come to um, Columbia. They're actually still back at, at Philly. They're gonna move in the middle of uh, this year, I do some work with the International Pemphigus and Pemphigoid Foundation, which is the medical um, organization, patient education and advocacy. Um, the SID is our investigative uh, research uh, um, organization, incredibly supportive, similar to anesthesiology. Um, there are sister organizations such as the Dermatology Foundation that give career development awards. Great organization that really um, 
consolidates all of the research going on in dermatology. Um, I've been very involved with the National Institute of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases. So unlike Dr. Moore, where you know there's really a plethora of organizations um, and institutions that will fund, a lot of derm research will go through NIAMs. We obviously also have NCI, NIAID, and then there is um, ARC and some of the health outcomes uh, centers. I also founded a biotech company based on the research that came um, through my laboratory. And so that's been a, a substantial portion of my last five years, uh, not so much anymore. Okay, so why should we consider physician scientists training in dermatology nationally? This is blocking, so I'm gonna move. So basically, um, science and innovation. So similar to Dr. Moore and Dr. Emila, um, diverse fields of study that are relevant to the skin. Almost every cell type is in the skin. You have immune cells, ner nerve cells. Um, so there's a big field on neuroimmune um, interactions and pain and itch um, that is relevant to skin. Um, you've also got um, basically anything related to development, cancer, um, et cetera, sort of you name it. We also have health outcomes, epidemiology, clinical trials, and dermatology. So really, no matter what your PhD is in, um, if that is your field, um, you can basically find an application in the skin. Um, we are a very tight-knit community, so a very engaged and collaborative investigative dermatology community. There is a future academicians retreat that is targeted towards first year dermatology um, residents. We basically invite them to the SID meeting and we basically just do a full day of professional career development, basically introducing you to all of the resources that are in the field. We have a strong international society for investigative dermatology. So um, we're really integrated with our European and Asian colleagues. So you can travel the world um, with dermatology. And support, you know, in general, dermatology programs are generally profitable and we can support research programs, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. So um, here's the structure of uh, a typical dermatology residency. So you'll do an internship and this is often um, in pediatrics or internal medicine. Some people will do a transitional year. You then do a traditional three-year dermatology residency, take the boards and get a job. Um, many programs have what they call a three plus one or a two plus two fast track. No matter what they call it, it's often the same. It's just sort of how you count up the years. So to be board certified in dermatology, you have to have a minimum of 2.25 years of uh, clinical training. And so some people will divide that up in different ways. Um, at Penn, what we did was you just went 2.25 years straight and then you had the last three quarters of the year in your third year to go into the laboratory and do a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, because we have nothing that you have to fast track into, because it's not like you have to fast track into a GI um, subspecialty. Um, basically, what happens is at the end of the three years, you basically take the boards and get a raise um, to an instructor level. And then you basically become an instructor postdoc for however long it takes um, to basically be competitive for a tenure track position. During that time, you typically do five half days a month or so of clinic, which is one half day a week of your continuity clinic and one with a residence. During that time, we expect that you present and publish, you get a career development award. And once you get that, you can go out on the job market, uh, get a job and prosper. Um, now, I will say that um, there's a number of programs that don't have that structure. Maybe they don't have a T32 that can easily support you during that time. And there's a number of different ways to make it work. I will also say that dermatology is an incredibly competitive specialty. And some people, for example, may be slightly stronger on the research side of things than they are on the clinical side of things and may have difficulty matching at one of the so-called quote unquote top tier programs. So there are multiple options to still pursue what you wanna do. Um, and one of them is to do research after residency. So you go to your internship, do a dermatology residency, take the boards and then move to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the same or at a different institution. Some of the programs basically allow you to use your elective time, which could be anywhere from three to nine months split out across these years to do a, a postdoctoral fellowship. Although I will say, depending on the type of research you do, it can be challenging to break it up um, across several years with downtime in between. In other specialties, it could be fabulous because you can basically generate a, a big data set and then just analyze it um, you know, on your spare time during the downtime. And the other possibility is that, um, again, depending on your area of research, um, it may actually be beneficial to you to just come right on as an assistant professor, 
qualify for KL2 and other type awards that allow you to get training during your assistant professorship, because chances are you'll make more money as an assistant professor while you're getting the training than you would have as an assistant, as an instructor fellow. So um, I think that basically when you've seen one institution, you've seen one institution, and I would agree that the probably the most important thing is how motivated the chair is at supporting your career development. So I'm going to skip um, some of this in the interest of time, but I did want to just um, go forward um, to something uh, that Dr. Horowitz showed just to indicate that Durham is what we call a non-traditional specialty. It's about 4% of the applicants will go into Durham. Um, but I wanted to share this final slide, which is that 48% of dermatology MD PhDs end up in academics full time. But when you look at the academic physician scientists, interestingly enough, dermatologists are the most likely of these so-called non-traditional specialties to end up devoting a significant proportion of their effort to research. So internal medicine is always considered the gold standard. This is basically your percent research effort. So these are people who are spending 100% of their time doing research, meaning that they're no longer seeing patients. So if you think about the traditional gold standard of like 70 to 80% time research, Durham perfectly overlaps internal medicine during that time. I think a very important thing to notice, though, is that basically in dermatology, you're either doing greater than 70% time, which is like here, or it just rapidly falls off. And then essentially, most of the other people are doing less than 20% time research down here. So essentially, right, this goes from like 40% to like 47%. There's just no 50-50 model in dermatology so far. I'm actually interested in kind of changing that and understanding how we can better support people in that path. So I'll just close by saying it's a great specialty for fusing innovative science, Medicaid, medicine, education, and your other professional pursuits. So thanks for coming by and learning more about it. Thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Payne. I believe our next panelist is Dr. Harpel, who will be speaking to surgery. Going to try to uh, share my screen here in just a second. Sure. If it's going to allow. Eh, looks like it's not going to. Can you all see it or not? I don't see it, but all I can right. Well, I will discuss. So, so um, briefly, the unique thing about the American Board of Surgery. My mentor was Dr. David Sabiston, who set up the first physician scientist surgical program in 1962 at Duke. So we've been doing this for over 60 years, and the American and when Dr. Sabiston was head of the American Board of Surgery in the 60s, he actually changed the requirements such that. Uh, research years can be embedded in surgery without any penalty. Uh, and that is something that uh, we found in our on our uh, R38s with peds and medicine that you cannot do. We were able to get peds and medicine to allow a year, but in surgery, you can take out as many years as you want to. And for instance, it, it, I, I run our physician scientist training program at Duke, and I, I have 25 residents uh, in their laboratory years. It's usually after the R2 year. Uh, everyone in our residency does two years of research. A third of my residents do three years and a, and a quarter of my residents get their PhDs. Now, about half of my residents already have their PhDs, but all of the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery allow as much research time as one wants any time during their residency. So it is very flexible. Usually the break point is at the R2 to R3 year, but it can be any time uh, during that. So it really does allow the seamless integration of research training uh, during your research residency. The advantage is, is one does not have to wait to do their to their fellowship years. Uh, and uh, and what we've allowed by this process is to get your research years during your residency on, and then get bridge funding towards that. Uh, the other opportunity is for us uh, with the R38 mechanisms and the T32, there are about 65 T32s in surgery departments. Uh, and there are a number of R38s. Uh, we have two in surgery uh, at Duke uh, that, again, allow support for residency training. And okay. so that uh, when one finishes surgery, it, it certainly does set up a tremendous opportunity. Now, the vast majority of surgery programs do not integrate research. Uh, but due to 
uh, as I say, if you make widgets and your your institution wants you making widgets, uh, that's what a lot of surgery programs do is because you're the we are the uh, engine that drives medical centers. But there are a number of the major academic centers uh, such as mine where um, the research years are you know are 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 part of it. Uh, and and it's and it's definitely something that uh, we find a, a lot of resident uh, resident applicants are interested to. So we get two thousand applicants at Duke. We interview a hundred and we pick seven. Uh, and so um, and and we're like a number of the major programs in academic surgery where it's 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 definitely very uh, very sought after by medical students. It is paramount that uh, that care and surgeons are involved with everything. Our Surgical research training can varies from uh, research on education uh, to translational to genomics to health outcomes to disparities and and a major effort in surgery has been uh, the opportunity to do global health, the sort of teaching someone to fish versus uh, fishing for them and and really working uh, towards developing uh, surgical training and surgical uh, systems uh, throughout the developing world to really uh, impact uh, healthcare. So uh, I, I um, the flexibility for academic training and surgery is second to none. The, uh, the support through foundations and our societies and so forth is also uh, second to none. And we're fortunate to partner a lot with industry on devices uh, and technologies, which which does and allow us to have resources to support um, our resident education. And uh, and again, in the breakout sessions, I'm happy to talk more about it. I'm trying to make this short so that we're allowed to hear from all speakers. But suffice to say that, that uh, academic training, especially physician scientist training uh, in surgery, has has been present uh, since the uh, the eighteen hundreds and 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 continues to grow. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Nadar Portian. Great, thank you. Um, I put together a couple slides. I'll see if I could share them because uh, I felt left out by not having them. Um, let me see if I can do this. Is that sharing? Yes, we can see them. Okay, great. Um, I'm Nader Paradian. I am a neurosurgeon scientist I'm at UT uh, Southwestern. Uh, by way of orientation, I uh, am an MD PhD graduate myself from uh, UCLA. Uh, I did my residency training at the University of Virginia uh, and then immediately took a faculty position uh, back at UCLA and moved to UT Southwestern uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, now I, I lead the program here. Uh, you know, neurosurgery is a, a really interesting field. I think it's a little bit different than uh, the physician scientists in other areas of medicine, um, only in that the, uh, as you saw in the graph uh, that was uh, shown by Amy, the, the, the amount of time that we can dedicate as neurosurgeons to science, but or vice versa, the amount of time that we need to dedicate to clinical work in order to uh, provide uh, or achieve a certain level of, achieve and maintain a certain level of excellence is uh, a little bit uh, different or is there's higher demands. And so um, our field of neurosurgery hasn't evolved in the way that other areas have um, in having dedicated physician scientist training programs, but our uh, American uh, Board of Neurosurgery uh, and our American Academy of Neurosurgery have created pathways that encourage and allow neurosurgical programs to um, really develop uh, clinician scientists, uh, which I'll share with you in a moment. Nader, I think that you're uh, muted. Thank you. Uh, so before I get into some of the details, thank you. Have I been muted the entire time or just for the last? Just the last sentence, maybe. Okay. Stay okay, up to that point. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so the field of neurosurgery is quite broad. Uh, you know, there are multiple subspecialties in neurosurgery. I myself am uh, in a field of functional neurosurgery, uh, which uh, deals with brain uh, function. 
through the way of uh, recording from the brain uh, for, for example, epilepsy surgery or stimulating the brain for uh, movement disorders. Uh, there is the field of neuro-oncology or brain tumor surgery, uh, cerebrovascular surgery, so there are surgeons that deal with uh, aneurysms, brain hemorrhages, uh, vascular disease, uh, both uh, intracranial and extracranial. Uh, there's pediatric neurosurgery, trauma neurosurgery, pain is another area uh, as well. So you have multiple areas that can be touched and the research is quite different and the scientists uh, in the areas are uh, quite different. Uh, I think what drives people to become neurosurgeon scientists are uh, really two motivations that I would uh, summarize. One is the excitement or the opportunity to use the operating room as your laboratory. Uh, the idea that we have unique access to the human brain and human brain tissue, either to study function or to study pathology or um, you know, study the inflammatory processes that may be involved in the various diseases that we treat. The other uh, mantra that a lot of people use or neurosurgeon scientists use is that they want to put, we want to put ourselves out of business. The idea that surgery itself uh, may not be the end all be all. And if we can use the unique opportunities that we have from neurosurgery to study the tissues, develop novel therapies, uh, that we may be able to develop a less invasive means of uh, providing uh, care and, and translating uh, what we do in the lab into uh, beneficial uh, outcomes for our patients. Uh, the types of research that uh, we see in neurosurgery are uh, really span from benchtop research, uh, much as like we've heard from uh, other uh, presenters, um, molecular work, genomic work, a uh, lot, lot of growth in the area of neuroinflammation. Um, as my work is, a lot of my work is in not benchtop. Um, I don't have a wet lab. I, my operating room is my laboratory. So I uh, record uh, directly from patients' brains during uh, surgery to understand brain function, understand disease. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in engineering. Uh, and then uh, some new, uh, more emerging areas uh, that you know, are new, newer to neurosurgery, but critical to a lot of er other areas of medicine. But uh, you know, outcomes, temps research, socioeconomic research, uh, ethics is also a huge growing area uh, given the uh, merger or intersection of uh, neurosurgery and engineering. Uh, we have multiple funding sources, and this is where um, it's been quite influential in our field. Uh, we, we as neurosurgeons are, are funded primarily by the uh, NINDS, Neurological Diseases and Stroke, uh, but also uh, more recently, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health, as neurosurgery enters into the field of uh, caring for patients with mental health with uh, psychiatric neurosurgery. Um, and we've been huge beneficiaries in particular of uh, the BRAIN initiative, which has invested uh, large amounts of money into neurological and neurosurgical research, as well as the HEAL initiative. Um, and I should also add the SPARK initiative, uh, all of these HEAL being focused on uh, pain work and uh, spark being uh, the idea of the intersection of the peripheral nervous system uh, and the rest of the body. Uh, the way that we've been beneficiaries, and the reason why I want to show some slides are um, that the NIH, uh, NINDS actually in particular, uh, made a concerted effort to want to increase uh, funding and to increase the number of neurosurgeon scientists. And uh, Steve Korn, who's the director of training at uh, NINDS, uh, has made very specific investments in training programs for neurosurgeon scientists at the resident level, as well as the early faculty level. And those are R25 programs, as well as a K-12 uh, program. R25 is basically the equivalent of T32s. Uh, neurosurgery does not have uh, uh, T32s, it's funded through the R25 mechanism, which is a funded one, two, or even up to three years uh, by the NIH for uh, dedicated uh, research time, protected at the 75% level for uh, the 75 or 50% level, uh, depending on the year of research. Um, it has had a tremendous impact, both of those programs, in terms of the change in funding that we've experienced in neurosurgery over the past 10 years. Uh, you can also see um, the amount of uh, total funding that has, uh, sorry, you see a, a percent change in funding, also the uh, amount of uh, funding between neurosurgeons and non-neurosurgeons in neurosurgery departments. Um, 
this slide in particular is very useful to see and it shows the impact um, and it the the gray bars uh, show so the R25 program being the, the program that funds neurosurgery residents during training K12 program being uh, for early investigators is essentially the, like a K08 or K23 but dedicated for neurosurgery and you can see the number of early stage investigators in black who are funded by the R25 and K12 whereas those people who don't achieve funding through one of those mechanisms, that's been relatively flat over time. Uh, that has been a cornerstone to growing our uh, physician scientist uh, workforce in neurosurgery. Uh, a little bit more about how training is done in neurosurgery. Uh, because we don't have physician scientist training programs per se, it's up to uh, residency programs, as we heard from many other speakers, to create their own flavor of what they want to do. And there are some residency programs that are very focused on training physician scientists. Um, I would say you know, where I was at UCLA and now here at UT Southwestern, we've been very focused on that and, and creating uh, protected years to do research, uh, usually at two years research, and that's part of your residency program. So neurosurgery residency is always seven years now, or at least seven years. Um, and up to two of those years can be uh, at least partially protected to do research. You can also take time off to do additional research. And we've had residents uh, do that and get their PhDs. Um, when you do your research varies depending on your residency program. It could be in your PGY-3 or PGY-4 year, and there's usually an additional year in PGY-6 or PGY-7. Uh, programs that are really dedicated to training physician scientists will have the R25 program, although it's a competitive program. Um, and so not all institutions are able to uh, get that. Uh, one really interesting thing about the R25 program, and I think it speaks to the environment, training environment, is that increasingly the NNDS wants the training program to span neurology and neurosurgery, realizing that uh, the science and uh, the work the clinicians do is, is have great overlap. Um, and I think that speaks to the opportunities there are to achieve uh, a diversity of training and work with a number of investigators. Uh, and so for example, our, our 25 program is uh, between neurology and, and neurosurgery together. Uh, most people upon finishing their residency will do a fellowship and fellowships are uh, have different flavors as well. Uh, they can be you know, purely clinical because you need extra clinical training or they can be a blend between uh, clinical and uh, research. Um, it's a little bit more of you know, design your own program, but the vast majority of people uh, will go uh, from residency to a fellowship program, which is one or maximum two years and then into a faculty appointment uh, with uh, research support. In terms of the percent effort, uh, it is different. Uh, as I started off, uh, we have multiple physician scientists in our department, and uh, most physician scientists in neurosurgery across the country are targeted at about the 50% research effort. Uh, that's what uh, the NINDS uh, requires. So NINDS Sorry, I should say NIH generally requires 75% research effort for K awards for neurosurgery. And I think some other surgical specialties now, it's a 50% requirement. And that's generally the mantra now across uh, neurosurgical uh, departments that are hiring academic physician scientists. It's 50% research effort. It can sometimes go higher than that, uh, but that's the most common. Um, you know, I think we've had in the last 10 years, uh, Organized neurosurgery has really focused on this and made some great changes, and it's been it's paid off uh, with tremendously increased uh, funding and success. So it's a great field. We we get to do great fun things. Uh, the clinical side of it is outstanding. Uh, I think all of us who are in it and doing uh, science and clinical work really love both aspects of what we do and wouldn't give up either part of it. So looking forward to speaking with anyone who's interested. Thank you so much for your uh, talk on neurosurgery. So our last panelist for the evening is Dr. Schanecker, who will speak to orthopedics. And while he pulls up his slides, if there are any questions from the audience, feel free to drop them in the chat. These could be for all the panelists or for um, individual panelists as well. And other panelists, feel free to also respond via the chat. Great, can you hear me okay? Can you see my slides? Yes, to both. perfect. So I have to be honest uh, with uh, 
um, Dr. Horowitz there. This is when Chris Williams asked me to do this. I kind of chuckled a little bit. And to explain my chuckle about that, um, Amy Payne gave the perfect slide, which I quickly screenshotted and added in here. If you take a look at this and you look at orthopedics, um, we're not doing too great. <laughs> and one of the reasons I think Chris and I have talked about this so much recently is, is I think there's a great need to improve this, not just in orthopedics, but in all of the interventional areas of medicine. And so what I've done is constructed a uh, talk to just really stimulate, hopefully, some questions about people who are on here thinking about doing interventional training that requires psychomotor training and residency, because it can be very different than if you're doing something that doesn't have that psychomotor training. And it's very important to think about that. I am uh, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon here at Vanderbilt. I actually am one of those people in terms of where you live on this slide here. My partners like to say that I'm about 75% clinical and 75% research. Um, I drink a lot of coffee. I did all of my training at Duke and then here at Vanderbilt and then up in Boston and then came back here. And I've had the fortune of having great mentors here have really looked out of trying to make a change in this graph that you see here. One of the main ones was uh, Dr. Urbanic at Duke. I did my uh, MD, PhD in the surgery department and Urbanic, who is the orthopedic chair, when I said I wanted to switch over to the MD, PhD track, he did three things that I think is really important for everybody to think of. The first thing he did is have me do an opportunity cost analysis on my entire career for taking time off to do research as opposed to doing surgery. And Dr. Horowitz alluded to that as, as a reason as, as to why some people will decide not to continue doing research. And I have great insight in on that, that if we want to get into later would be great to talk about. The second thing he did, it told me is, is you're going to have to apologize when you apply for residency as to why you were distracted uh, for doing a PhD, which I think is actually real. And I'd love to talk about that at the end as well as, as to how to handle that. Then what he said is, is that if you really love doing this and your curiosity is in this field, pay attention to the things that we're losing at. And it's like shooting fish in a barrel in orthopedics to actually get funded. And that has been the case. And so going through, that's what I'd like to set up for you guys to take out of this. So if you're going into orthopedics, the goal is, is to get to Chicago in July. That's where you become a board certified orthopedic surgeon. My path of this, obviously four years pre-medical, four years medical, five years residency, one year fellowship, two years of practice. I did one year of wellness where it was wonderful. I met my wife and then I did three years of my PhD. And if you look at that, 19 years of training to get this certificate is when you think about that opportunity cost, and this is what uh, Urbanic had me calculate out, is pretty considerable. So along those lines, why does it take so long? Why do you need to put so much into this training? And why don't we fast track in orthopedics? Well, that's in orthopedics requires, although a lot of people like to make fun of orthopedic surgeons and say we don't need cognitive reason reasoning, but we really do is that if you think about the ICDs that exist, there are 68,000 of them. So in medical school, your goal is, is to take a look at all the different ways the human can be diseased and figure out which ones you wanna spend time in. Well, two thirds of these are musculoskeletal. Two thirds of these essentially are within orthopedics and they range anything from supracondylar humerus fracture and to some of my favorites for those of you who are still paying attention, is injured while water skiing, while the skis are on fire. That actually is an ICD. And then one of the even better ones is uh, injury from being sucked into a jet engine, which, which I find amazing is there is one that says a follow-up for that. So along those lines though, is, is that you need to take a look at all of those, figure out what you wanna focus on, but they take a while to learn that pattern. Then when it comes to the psychomotor training of this, CPTs are the things that we do to people. There are 10,000 of those. And in orthopedics, there's roughly about 1,000 that you go through to train to become a board certified orthopedic surgeon. And again, these can range anything from taking a blood pressure to a hip replacement. The psychomotor training is the part you have to really think about on this. 
One of the best pieces of advice Urbanic also gave me is, is that if you want people to pay attention to your research, you need to be a good surgeon. Is, is that if you're a really good interventionalist, people will listen to you more about what you're doing research on. And that's been very true. And if we go by the uh, what was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, the 10,000 hours to become really proficient at something, when it comes to surgery itself, it's very similar. And as you think about this, what Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games, 26 times. I've been trusted to take game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again, and that's why I've succeeded. Well, in orthopedics, we don't get to say that. I don't get to say I've messed up more than 9,000 surgeries in my career. I've lost almost 300 patients. I've failed over and over again, and that's why I succeed. So instead, when you go off for orthopedic education, you're really looking for a place, and we've calculated this out for your five years to become the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell talks about is 2,300 cases. And so essentially you're looking for training to be able to be involved in 2,300 cases with all the different representation of pathologies, which comes down to chance that those things land at night. And that's where the sayings came from, mostly popularized by Duke. The problem with every other night call, you miss half the cases. And if you don't get it done in 24 hours, you might need to stay up late. Part of that is, is to take advantage of that chance to get exposure to all of those cases. The other part to understand about much of what happens in surgical fields or interventional fields, we would love to practice evidence-based medicine. And that is a little bit difficult for this reason. If you take the spheres of evidence-based medicine where clinical intuition wraps into patient values, that's considered intuitive medicine. Evidence-based medicine is where all three spheres come together. And the ideal is, is that we're practicing this. In pediatric orthopedic surgery, we're lucky if we have this in terms of our evidence-based medicine, which means that 90% of what we practice is our opinion. And it's not just our understanding of the disease, but how we hold the scalpel. Along those lines, with our rare diseases with variable presentations, it's very difficult to do randomized bias, unbiased studies. So with that, in terms of my practice, the majority of what I do is EBI and realize that so much of this EBI or evidence-based intuition comes from having been around really good mentors that taught me how to look at diseases because much of this I can't go and look up in a textbook. So with that practice, comes that question of how do I get all this? I don't want to skip out on any of that training. And then you say, how in the heck am I also going to do research at the same time? My biggest piece of advice, if you're going into this field that Urbanic taught me about on this, make it so your training is your research. Make it so in the operating room, you really pick up on the big villains that we can't take care of. That is, is learn how to take EBI and turn it into EBM. It's an incredible opportunity. I can give many pieces of advice how to do that in terms of making it so that your research that you're doing is your education, not needing to take as much time off to do that. The final thing I want to say, and I think this is for everybody at this point that I wish I had done where you are right now, is some great advice that um, I picked up about a year or two in. The most important thing is you pick a program and a path that has a great mentors. And you can be very deliberate about finding these. And this is how you wanna think about it. A mentor is more than one thing. There are four things that you need. You need a mentor, coach, hero, and sponsor. These four can be the same person, but here's how you wanna think about it. The mentor is the true Socrates. This is the person who's a mirror that you can sit down and talk about and figure out what your curiosity and passions are. Know yourself. A coach is somebody, once you start figuring that out, that shows you how to get there, telling you this is what you do. A hero is somebody like Urbanic for me that you look at and say, if I could be like that person when I'm 50, when I'm 60, et cetera, that's my target. A sponsor is somebody who will promote you, get you into the right society, get you into different opportunities that make it so that you can pull off what you want to do. At this point of where you are, what I would recommend is you take this and you make a grid. 
mentor, coach, sponsor, hero, clinical research, your educational path, administrative, and all the other things that you do. And start filling in who those people are that you go to. And you will find that no is not an answer. It's what form of yes are you willing to accept? Is, is that these are the type of things that you do now to make it so you can clear your path to get there. So along those lines, in anything that comes of uh, interventional academics, you want to look at programs that have the best mentorship, uh, we just talked about it, a good mix of EBM and EBI with great opportunities to turn that into your academic career. I look forward to talking about this and uh, um, I'm curious to see how many people go into the orthopedic room. <laughs> great, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Schenecker. And we all appreciated the animations. <laughs> um, so our next portion of this presentation will be the group Q&A. So I will pose a couple questions based on kind of what's been coming in through the chat. And thank you to our panelists who have been responding in there. Um, so a common question that is appearing is some iteration of uh, does the alignment between research and the PhD phase have to align with the clinical interests and uh, potential specialty that they are interested in going into. And some additional follow-ups to that um, also include how are social scientists and humanities PhDs viewed in the application process for your specialty or program? And um, if these dual degree trainees are also compared in a pool with MD or DO only applicants, uh, how are they evaluated in different or similar ways? Well, you know, I'll certainly take the first question. I, did, I, I alluded to it in the chat. Having a scientific background and a degree shows focus, drive, and the aptitude to succeed. If you look at academic physicians, they actually, the, from the NIH, the average number of pivot is around three during their career and what they do and what they study. And if I look at myself, my gosh, I, I'm, an onco I'm, I'm an oncologist and have had a translational lab for 30 years. And we have changed what we've done innumerable times based on you know, what we found and, and how the field change, it, the field's evolving. And so you know, someone asked, well, if their research is in uh, in basic, uh, say, uh, dermatologic immunology, you know, does that hinder them from getting uh, a residence position in, in neurosurgery or or whatever? And the answer is no. I think it shows that you have that, uh, and and you can adapt these things. Uh, we want, you know, this is where uh, high tides float all boats. You know, our goal here is to grow the field of of uh, physician scientist. And the last thing we'd want to do is to hinder someone's success by, you know, uh, tunnel visioning uh, their career by saying they can't, uh, you know, we're not going to allow them to be adaptable. I would argue that physician scientists are probably the most adaptable physicians and others may want to add. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that completely. And I think that the main thing to remember is, is that the PhD is a philosophy degree and it's how to approach a scientific problem. And um, you know, most of my PhD was in coagulation and uh, learning that translated so well into doing bone biology. And it's pretty incredible once you come up with the method of how to approach a scientific problem and ask the right question and read and come up with the experiences is that translates so well into pivoting into other areas. And one last thing I'll say is that, you know, although historically med medical uh, postgraduate education has been based in, in uh, pigeonholes of different fields, research is not. And I really could care less if one had their training in internal medicine, emergency medicine, pathology, whatever. Uh, you know, we tend to group ourselves in fields of uh, lung development, of physiology, uh, inflammation, cancer, these kind of things. And, and if you look at those fields and who is funded, 
you know, because, you know, I review every every cycle for the NCI. I, I don't really care what someone's background is. I'm more interested in what their research is and what they're doing. And so I think that we really almost should be agnostic to what your background is. It's more important for us to, group to you know, that uh, that we move forward as a field. And investigation now is really group science. There's really not individual science. It's we, you know, we work together as teams. Thank you. Let's go to Dr. Amala and then uh, Dr. Rutan, if you, I saw you unmute, so you can go next. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what um, my two previous colleagues just spoke to as far as um, are you pigeonholed into a specific area of research based on what you do um, uh, prior to residency? And, and I would say absolutely not. It's really a demonstration that you've developed a skill set about how to approach a scientific question. Um, and and uh, very much opens the door to exploration going forward. I think the second part of the question was about MD, PhD versus MD and how they're looked upon. Um, I, would, I would say in general that um, having a, a research background, if you're looking at a PSTP program, um, if you've had an advanced degree, if you've done research, it's certainly a predictor that you probably will be dedicated to, to do uh, research going forward. So I think in general, at least in anesthesiology, we would look for people with a passion and a drive to do research that would have a leg up um, if they were applying to a PSTP program. I just add on to that. Um, I think that that's exactly right, certainly in emergency medicine. And, you know, we collected some data on this from program directors in emergency medicine recently. And I, I guess what I would say is that probably in all of our specialties, there are a lot of different kinds of residencies and the kinds of residencies that prioritize people who have had significant research training and research interests are probably the kinds of residencies that you want to go to if that's what you want to do. Um, and uh, where there's uh, variation in that, um, that's where you'll find good mentors and program directors that understand what you're trying to accomplish and um, uh, really have a pathway to success. I'll just make a, a brief comment. You know, early on when I was starting up my lab, I, I was speaking to another investigator and I said, what kind of people do you hire? And he says, I hire all kinds of people with all different training backgrounds. And I think the best programs are going to be that same way that they see that there's an opportunity in people with diverse training backgrounds that will enrich their program with different perspectives. Uh, so in, in fact, to some extent, I think some of us are turned off by people who do exactly what they think they need to do to get into a training program. We want you to be true to yourself and be the best scientist. And that's really what shines more than what box you, you check off. Great, thank you so much for your responses. Um, our next question will be um, kind of going off of this question as well, but um, one thing that seems to be a common concern, especially with some of the specialties represented here today, is that they're competitive and not all of these specialties have as robust an infrastructure of PSTP programs like a specialty like internal medicine, for example. So if a applicant was also applying to non-PSTPs in those specialties, um, can you share any advice on how they could like DIY their PSTP journey if they match into those programs and uh, fulfill like those postdoc sort of training uh, portions of their career should they want to return to academic medicine. I, I can comment briefly. I think because we don't have PSTPs in neurosurgery, you, you can't make a program provide you with a training that they're not accustomed to doing. Uh, so we, we've heard it consistently, there's different types of programs out there. And whether you call it a PSTP or you call it something else, if what you're looking for is the opportunity to become a clinician scientist, and presumably that's what you want because you're here, um, you should look for programs that have a track record or investment or a stated commitment to doing it, whether or not they have a named program. Uh, it's uh, it's just, it's harder to do if, if it just, it doesn't exist already or if there hasn't been a pathway, it doesn't mean it's impossible but you, you should think about where you apply. 
the vast majority of residencies are designed to train clinical physicians to go into practice and, and do healthcare. One who is a physician scientist uh, and has an interest in academic medicine is not going to be comfortable in a program that is specifically designed to design, uh, to train physicians to go into practice. And so there are a number in all of the specialties of programs that specifically have academic tracks for physician scientists. And then one needs to find those programs and focus on those. And then that's not to disparage the clinical training programs. They're wonderful, but that's not their goal. And so you would just need to search out those places that meet your goals. Um, I was just responding to one aspect of the question, and also it refers to, is a PSTP the best way to continue doing research after an MD-PhD? It can be highly specialized. And you know, going back to this issue of the fact that dermatology is so competitive, just to put this in perspective, there are roughly 100 dermatology programs across the country, but honestly, there's only about... I want to say eight to 12 that have T32s. And of those programs, maybe the most that they would accept would be one to two per year. So you're just talking about a handful of positions that are available at these so-called, you know, top um, research PSTPs across the country. And yet many more than that ultimately go on to be NIH funded. Like I've known of people who've gone to these programs that don't have PSCPs and they still go on to be NIH funded. So I think that um, the answer is a little tricky in Durham. Like, I think there's a number of different ways to do it. And the reason why was um, something I had alluded to during my presentation, which is that sometimes you see people who are a little bit at a disconnect, you know, they're incredibly strong research wise, but maybe there are a couple blemishes on their clinical record and maybe, you know, um, it just doesn't work out at your top choice program, but, you know, absolutely, you know, um, when you make your rank list, go to one of the programs that has a really strong research field, even if they, you know, and as long as the chair appears was supportive of research, um, I think you can figure out a way to make it work. And regarding the PSCP, I think um, this came up in response to the humanities or social science PhDs, depending on the type of research you want to do, um, a traditional PSCP may not be the way, way to go, right? Because some of that research is actually best done through clinical trials. And if you already, you know, depending on how you can do that, some, some programs can allow you to actually get that training um, as a faculty member through an institutional TAIL-2 or CTSA award. So I think, you know, again, it, it's very, very dependent on the type of research you do. Okay, I think the last question I'll ask all the panelists is from an audience member. So this reads as, can you ask the panelists opinions on MD-PhD students interested in research in non-academic settings for their future careers? Um, like in biotech or? My assumption is like industry or um, in fields that are not canonically like academic medicine. Interesting. I mean, um, Jeannie Lee, who's an alum of the Penn um, MD program, she, you know, always said, I don't know why people leave uh, academics to go into private practice. You know, it's, it strikes me that industry is like a fantastic opportunity um, for MD PhDs to apply what they, what they know. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Obviously biotech is booming right now. There's multiple opportunities. I think that um, one of the questions is, if you're interested in that, what are your interests and how, like, how do you want to do it? So, for example, if you go over very early, um, so just as, to put this in perspective, when I was in my MD-PhD program, somebody actually said, nothing you ever do um, during your career will ever reach a patient in your lifetime. Because there, were, there used to be that slide that they would show, like, about the phases of clinical trials and how it would take you know, five years and then phase two would take however many years and phase three would then take another 10 years. And it's like 25 years down the road that your drug may actually make it into an FDA approval. And nowadays that actually isn't true. Um, you know, people are really uh, taking what's happened. Probably many of you on the call here today may have patented something and maybe your PI has started a biotech company and you have the opportunity to go over, right? So I think that this is something that's becoming more and more common. I think one of the challenges is, is um, you know, without the clinical training, you you don't 
have the benefit of being a licensed physician to basically be able to understand that aspect of the pathway. Um, I think when you go over after residency, same sort of thing applies. You know, people sometimes, you know, start their faculty position. If you can run a research laboratory successfully, right? You know that that person can run a research division at a biotech company. So I think that the farther you go and like establish your own independent, internationally renowned um, reputation, like basically the higher you can go when you go over to biotech, you know, the earlier you go over, you know, before you have any clinical training or, you know, any, you know, all levels of training, both in the clinical and the research side, you're much more likely to go over in a lower level position. And then I think it just becomes a little bit less um, common. Yeah, go for it, Dr. Bruno. Um, If I may just e expand on this, uh, I'm gonna share my screen and just show a couple examples of people who have um, succeeded uh, in non-traditional careers that I know about who are from, our program, and I'm not necessarily advocating it because these are genuinely high risk um, career pursuits, but two of the graduates of the University of Washington MSTP who've had the most impact in their careers uh, did something non-traditional. One of them is Bill Canfield, who did not do uh, an internship or residency went directly into postdoc and started a company and created one of the first um, FDA approved forms of enzyme replacement therapy um, uh, to treat uh, Pompe disease, uh, glycogen storage disease that affects the heart. And um, his story was turned into a uh, New York Times bestseller by an author who won the Pulitzer Prize and in turn, uh, they made a movie out of it in which he was portrayed by actor Harrison Ford. That doesn't happen very often to most uh, MD, PhDs. And then um, the other kind of remarkable success story, pardon me, uh, is uh, an alum of our program, uh, Bud Tribble, actually created the uh, original Apple Macintosh, uh, taking time off while he was a student um, to create the original operating system and, and uh, was a major architect of the hardware underlying the original Macintosh. He came back from um, Cupertino uh, to the University of Washington uh, to, to finish the rest of medical school and he matched in neurology, he did an internship year at Stanford uh, and then he was set to go to UCSF to complete his neurology residency, but he was recruited back to Apple uh, by this guy, Steve Jobs. Um, and then he um, followed Steve Jobs around. Uh, he was at um, uh, Next Computer and then he went back to Apple. And uh, I, I believe he recently retired as one of the longest uh, standing Apple employees. And he was uh, involved in um, all of Apple's major product development, uh, particularly the Apple Watch. And in fact, came back uh, to visit our program and talk to students on the day the original Apple Watch was released and explained how his training as a physician scientist had informed um, the underlying humanistic approach of the design principles um, that Apple embodies in the Macintosh iPhone and its, its other products. It was, it was quite uh, motivational. Uh, so for those of you, you know, who have, it sounds like an Apple commercial, maybe, who have um, crazy ideas or the dreamers, you, you know, there are um, a wealth of opportunities, but it is a, a high risk pathway to pursue and a relatively safer bet is to get that uh, residency under your belt and pursue it in kind of a uh, men mentored environment. And I'm sure for every story like this, there are plenty of people who who didn't succeed, but um, you know, really the sky's the limit and it depends on um, the, you know, uh, understanding yourself. And I think that slide uh, that uh, Dr. Schenecker showed about mentorship and understanding yourself is a very important part of making the key decisions. Thank you. Um, I will now stop the recording.